you have done some human trials, which I found really interesting. Um, especially the, and one of them that was is probably of good in, a lot of interest to our audience is the lowering of the blood sugar. And so could you talk about the way that works and also the fact that it was systemic? Oh yeah, I know that was, uh, I was, I was, <laughs> I was driving three hour journey to a research lab somewhere in a different part of England. And that's my time for sitting and talking to people and just thrashing out ideas because no one disturbs you. And a very good colleague of mine, Mike Powner, were driving along and said, well, you know, if we're making these mitochondria work harder, they've got to use more fuel themselves. And what mm -hmm. fuel do they use? What do they burn? They burn carbohydrates, sugars, and they burn oxygen. So... I said, we were driving along, I was saying, oh, that would, be, that would be too good to be true. And he said, but it has to be true. You have to burn more carbohydrate. And the only place you're really going to get fast carbohydrate is from your blood sugar. So we, we did an experiment on bumblebees. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we, we made bumblebees diabetic, and, and that worked brilliantly well. And we got ethical permission for it. And then we took people and we gave them a standard glucose tolerance test where you drink a disgusting amount of glucose and then you prick your finger on a regular basis and you test your blood glucose levels. And then we tested how much oxygen they were consuming by putting a tube up their nose and measuring their CO2 production. So everybody, after you've taken a big load of glucose, between half an hour and an hour, you get a big peak in your serum glucose. And the controls did that. The experimental people that we gave a burst of red light to, and we gave this a burst of red light on actually a relatively small region of their back, their blood glucose level didn't peak in the same way. And the reduction was very significant. The reduction was so significant, I said to my colleague, Mike, do it again. Do the whole thing again. I'm, I'm just not happy about this because, to be honest, if we get this wrong, we'll be cut to pieces. Mm. And um, we did it again. We got exactly the same effect. Now, these were healthy individuals. right? Mm -hmm. These were relatively healthy individuals. We are now three quarters of the way through um, a project where we're doing it with people with type 2 diabetes. And so far, we're getting exactly the same result. Now, why that? So that that makes sense. Mitochondria improved. They uh, that means you, they need more glucose. They need more oxygen. Um, why does this work with just a little area of illumination on your back? Well, the thing that's out there that we had paid relatively little attention to was that the moment you disturb mitochondria in one part of the body, they signal to mitochondria across the body and they do that well within 24 hours we know there's something going through your through your body called cytokines um they're inflammatory regulators and you can buy a cytokine kit from a company and you can just put body samples on that and it can measure your cytokines and we've done that we did that originally with mice and a burst of red light changes all the cytokines so that means your message goes around the body. It may not be the key message, but it's certainly a message. You go back 15, 20 years, people were doing experiments on little worms, changing mitochondria in one part of the body and noticing that all the other mitochondria in other parts of the body changed as well. So there is some way in which these mitochondria are talking to one another. That and, and there's a there's a, a diabetic lab, a very good diabetic lab in in the in the US, and they had a very similar result with affecting um, what goes on in the retina by shining light on the back of an animal, and the guys in Australia did exactly the same thing. So that made me feel good. It made me feel good that other people were at least replicating the paradigm. So my dream, which I said to the lab many years ago, as I said, I want to be able to have a system where you go to a cash machine, okay, and it takes you one minute, 15 seconds to get your cash out. I'm going to delay you in some small way. And you put your hand down on the cash machine, and that gets, a, you, you have to put your hand down, maybe to identify yourself, right, your fingerprint. And when you do that, you're identified by an infrared light. 
And we all said, yeah, yeah, you know, Star Trek. <laughs> um, it's not Star Trek now. That is theoretically perfectly possible because I do not have to deliver the light to the part of the body that I necessarily want to treat. Also, we know that deep red light, say at 850 nanometers, is going to go straight through your hand and be absorbed through the full depth of your hand. This is this is this is potentially doable. And mm. you can use at the same time that handprint to identify as a secondary identifier as you as a person. Um, it may not come out that way, but in theory, we don't have too much of a problem with progressing down that pathway. And you, so the light is before the glucose, or after the after you take the glucose. Well, test? no, uh, the, the, we gave the we gave the light before people had the glucose load, right? right? So you could call it prophylactic treatment. We treated before there was a problem. Now I don't know how the situation would change if I gave you the glucose load and then at fixed time points afterwards fired up your mitochondria with red light i don't know that mm. is it, i mean first of all from a big point of view does it matter mm. you know we, we we know we've got a way of doing this we also yeah. know that in big populations big population study in the netherlands and in the uk people with type 2 diabetes have lower peaks in their blood sugars if they work outside a lot where they're being exposed to a lot of long wavelength light compared with office workers who are not being exposed to long wavelength light so so the whole envelope here is looking relatively watertight you know mm. in principle this works do i particularly am i particularly concerned about when you get the burst of red light no not really i always prefer if we can to be prophylactic to treat you before there's a crisis but i'm not sure it's particularly important right so like before i go and have a big carb load i could shine some red light on myself and and it would have it would lower the spike it would lower the spike now i we also now have people walking around with instead of pricking people's fingers all the time which it's very difficult to get subjects for that i mean <laughs> it was a nightmare getting subjects for it yeah. um you know, we now have constant glucose monitors, mm, yeah. which we we put on the arm. And we're now getting a, a profile over a number of days in, in these type 2 diabetics. And it's very clear. The, your blood glucose levels do go up, but nowhere near as much. And when it comes to treating diabetes, someone can have high blood, high blood glucose. That's not the issue. The issue is the spiking. How much are they spiking and how sharp are those spikes? That's what your blood vessels really don't like. 